Good morning, everyone. Welcome to BC212, our course on Christian apologetics. Let's pray, and then we will get started. Father, we thank you once again for this opportunity to gather together and uh, spend this time in learning and being equipped. We ask for the anointing, the leadership, the ministry of the Holy Spirit to lead us and guide us. And uh, in the things we learn today, uh, may our understanding be enlightened, may our hearts be open, may our minds be open, and may we understand and may we use, Lord, our learning to serve you well and to serve people well. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. So we started yesterday um, to cover a new subject, a new topic, uh, which is um, uh, the topic of suffering. So I'm going to go ahead and share the notes. And uh, we want to get a biblical understanding of suffering why it's there and how do we understand it and also uh, uh, it's not easy to explain this to other people but at least it, in our minds if we are clear then over time uh, as we have opportunity and most importantly in a compassionate way uh, we can um, explain to people who have questions right uh, because when people are going through difficulty, that's not the time, you know, to bang them with <laughs> a lot of theology. That's the time to be compassionate. That's the time to sometimes just be quiet and come alongside them, you know. Uh, uh, so uh, we need to have a lot of wisdom when we talk about this subject with people, right? But our goal is, first of all, to get an understanding of it ourselves. So the first point that we emphasized as we began this topic is that we need to understand God's heart about this matter and uh, one of the most important ways we can understand the heart of God in this matter is to understand his original intent yeah now what was God's original intent uh, when he created things when he created us when he put us on the earth uh, we can see very clearly, both from Genesis and also from how he's going to make things to be in the book of Revelation, uh, we can see very clearly that uh, God's intent is uh, a place where there is no sin and there is no pain, where there is no suffering. It's very clear. And that's the way it was in the Garden of Eden before the fall, and that's the way it will be in the new heavens and the new earth, right? So God's intent is clearly expressed in both the beginning and in the future. And so that is the heart of God. And therefore, uh, we must understand the heart of God never changes about this matter. And uh, we should therefore always stay aligned to the heart of God in our perspective of suffering. That means God doesn't want it. God doesn't want um, sin. God doesn't want pain. God doesn't want sickness. God doesn't want violence and fighting and destruction. And he, he doesn't want that. That's not in his heart. And so our perspective also should be the same as the heart of God. Now, the next point we emphasized is, but the reality is, there is suffering. Right? Of course, we know the heart of God. Uh, we know what God's intent is. But the reality is in this world, uh, in which we are all living uh, in the duration of life, that now is, you know, something 80, 60, 70, 80, whatever the duration of life is, different people have, uh, there is all kinds of suffering. And Jesus said, you know, John 16, 33, in this world, you will have tribulation. So he told us, look, it's there. Right. And we also said that there will be suffering in all three realms. So there is what we call a spiritual, there is emotional, there is physical, there is spirit, soul, body. People suffer in all three realms. So spiritual, 
is a direct attack, demonic attack on the spirit of a person, on the heart of a man. So the spirit of a man can be oppressed, can be possessed, can be tormented. Um, one minute. Okay. Uh, so the spirit of a man can be hurt, can be wounded, can be grieved. Uh, you know, we feel things deep in our spirit. Then the emotions, the soul part of a person can also uh, be hurt. The people can be hurt emotionally. Uh, uh, so there is suffering in that. And then there's physical, like sickness, disease, pain. That's all. So there is suffering in all three realms that people experience. Uh, and so our uh, what we want to un, you know, uh, understand is why is that suffering and then what do we do about it? What are we supposed to do about it as believers? Knowing the heart of God, but the heart of God is no pain, no sin, no suffering. That's the heart of God. The reality is it is there. So what are we to do as believers? We are in this world, but we know our Father's heart how do we engage, right? Uh, and so we must always come from the Father's heart as we deal with these matters. So let us understand why there is suffering, or biblically, right? People may give other lots of other reasons, but biblically, what are some reasons uh, that we can see? And we're going to cover these six reasons. Uh, suffering due to the bondage of corruption, Suffering due to one's own actions, suffering due to satanic, that's demonic work, suffering due to other people's actions, uh, suffering due to divine judgment, and suffering due to willing sacrifice. Okay. Uh, anybody has any questions? Uh, here, somebody's mic on. Uh, let me see. Okay, all mics are off. Okay. So we're going to cover these six. Uh, uh, reasons or six, yeah, six reasons as to why uh, we experience suffering, and then we'll talk about you know how are we to respond as well. So let's talk about the first one: suffering due to the bondage of corruption. What does that mean? So Paul brings this out in Romans chapter eight, and then also we see you know other parallel texts. But Romans chapter 8 is the main passage which we will go to. So if you go to Romans chapter 8, and could somebody read for us Romans 8, 17, Romans 8, 17 to 23, or, yeah, 23, please. Romans 8, 17 to 23, please. Somebody can read it. Uh, I'll read first. Please go ahead. Romans chapter 8, 17 to 23. And if children, then as, as of God, and joint as with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, then we may also be glorified together. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. Not only that, but we also who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. Mm. So it's a very interesting passage. Um, now, let's look at it. In verse 17, Romans 8, 17, Paul, you know, Paul just tells us how wonderful, what a wonderful spiritual life we have. He says, you know, we are children of God, we are heirs of God, and we are joint as with Jesus. So that's beautiful, right? That's a spiritual position we have. 
uh, what an amazing spiritual position to be called the children of God and to be called heirs of God and joint as co-equal, co-heirs with Christ. You know, that's an amazing thing. That's a spiritual side. But in that same verse, he then transitions into the natural side. And the natural side is, if indeed we suffer, that we may also be glorified. So on one side, spiritually, hey, we are children of God, we are heirs of God, we are co-heirs with Christ. But on the other side, in this world, there is suffering. And we, who are children of God, we, are, we also are experiencing that, the suffering. But we know we are going to be glorified together. So then he begins to explain that suffering part. Right? Verse 18 on. So he says, I consider that the sufferings of this present time, that means in this present time, all of us, including us who are believers, we are experiencing sufferings. So he talks about the sufferings of this present time. And we know that the end of this chapter, Romans 8, he gives a long list of all kinds of suffering that happens. Right? Persecution, nakedness, peril, sword, uh, famine, uh, all kinds of things he lists. Right. So there are the sufferings of this present time. But the encouragement, the hope that we have is that whatever we go through, in this present time, it's not doesn't come anywhere close to the glory that we are going to experience. So that's our hope. As children of God, as heirs of God, or joint heirs with Christ, in this present time there is suffering, but whatever we are going to go through, it is still not. It's, it's incomparable with the beautiful things that God has for us in time to come. Then he begins to explain, why is there this suffering? Verse 19, yeah, he's getting into the details. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. So even creation is waiting for that revealing of the sons of God. So we are the sons of God, and there will come a time when the sons of God, as, as children of God, you know, we will step into the glorious things that God has planned for us. That we, we will, you know, we will be revealed. That is, we will step into it. And even creation, that means all of creation is expecting that. You know, so he's saying even creation is looking forward to that. He, as sons and daughters of God, as as a God, we know it, and that's our hope, and we are looking forward to it. But now he's changed his focus now to creation, and says this natural world is also looking for it. Verse twenty. For the creation, then he tells us something about what happened to creation. That means this natural world, in which we are living in, which God created. It was twenty. Creation was subject to futility that means creation all that God created came in subjection to futility things that are futile that means that are uh, futile simply literally means to be empty right? it's not resulting in anything good it's uh, vain it's empty so creation you know, God in the beginning, God created everything. It was good, but something happened that this creation, which was good, went in subjection to. That means it was overpowered by something else that caused it to become futile, become empty. Right? So it says, for creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of Him who subjected it in hope. That means this was not. God's will. God didn't let it go willingly, that this was not his plan, but it happened. But God let it go because he let it become subject to futility because he did it in hope. That means he knew the future, he knew what was the end outcome. So temporarily, 
creation is subjected to futility. God let it go, not willingly. It was not part of his plan, but he let it go because of the future plan, the hope that he had, the future that he knew was there. Verse 21, because the creation itself will also be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. So creation will also experience a great deliverance. But right now, what is the current state of creation? Verse 21, creation will be delivered from the bondage of corruption. So right now, creation is under the bondage of corruption. So that's where we get this, you know, this, this, this phrase, bondage of corruption. Is that from verse 21? Right? So right now, creation is in bondage to corruption. There is coming a time when it will be delivered from this bondage of corruption. And it will also be brought into this glorious liberty of the children of God. That means it will also come into the same glory that we are stepping into. That is the new heavens and the new earth. We're going to step into it. Creation will also come into it. But what is the present situation? The present situation is that creation has been subjected to futility. And verse 21, creation is under the bondage of corruption. It is in bondage. Bondage means it is now subjected to what? Corruption. Corruption means decay. It's a deviation from God's original design. So what do we understand? When God created everything, he created it perfect. All the systems and all the processes that God put in place was perfect. The weather conditions, the weather systems, the natural systems, the biological systems, everything God designed and he put in place was perfect. Right? He said everything will reproduce after his own kind. It will multiply. You know, man would multiply. A man and woman would multiply. Birds would, tree, birds would multiply. Vegetation would multiply. Everything he put in place was perfect. But something happened. Adam and Eve sinned. Satan and his demons got entrance into this world. So what happened? Everything was subject to futility and corruption. And so... Things have been in a state of decline or in a state of deviation away from God's original design. That's what this means. Creation is in the bondage of corruption. Things have been corrupted, right? So the systems, the processes that are happening in this world have been corrupted. So in the world that God designed, there were no earthquakes. There were no you know, volcanic eruptions, there were no tsunamis, there were no hurricanes and things that destroy lives, uh, there was no violence, and there was no sin, and there was no, you know, birth defects, and there was no uh, genetic disorders, there was no, none of that was there. But since the fall, all of creation is subject to corruption. It started deviating from God's original design, and God let it go willingly uh, not willingly just let it go because he knew he had this he had the future plan he knew there was going to be new heavens and the new earth so right now creation is under the bondage to corruption that means it's a deviation from god's original design so that is why so that is how we understand a lot of things you know why do bodies get old get old so god designed this human body to never die, that is before the fall, right? The body was never going to die. It would never decay. It came from the dust, but it would never decay. Uh, and we would eat of the tree of life and perpetuate it, symbolizing that this body will just live forever and ever. But after the fall, decay set in. And so you, you you see this in the Bible. You know those people. You know the early you know Adam and others lived. Adam, I think, lived for nine hundred years. That's like one millennium. <laughs> Methuselah lived like 967 years or something like that, the longest man who lived like on record. So they lived long lives, but it came to an end. Then slowly you see the now age, the lifespan decreasing, decreasing, decreasing. Finally, in Genesis 6, God says it's going to be 120 years. So can you imagine from close to 1,000 years, it comes down to 100 years. 
you know, 120 years. And then by the time we come to the Psalms, the Psalm says it's 80 years, something, three score years and 10, and if by grace, you know, we have another 10 years. So it's around 80, 90 years, something like that. So generally, you know, so a lifespan has reduced. Why? That was not God's design. God's design was the body will live on and on. But because of sin, everything is subject to corruption. So lifespan came down. Bodies started wearing out the human body, right? That's why, you know, we can read, you know, later on in 2 Corinthians 4, uh, 6 to 5, 5, you know, Paul says, you know, uh, our outward man is perishing. But God never designed the outward man to perish. It was originally designed to never die. But today we acknowledge the outward man is perishing. The body is perishing, right? But the glorious, the glory that we have is God will give us glorified bodies. Our bodies will become like the body of Jesus, right? So that's the hope we have. And even creation is looking forward to that, everything. So you look at, you know, the earth, yeah, like we said, all kinds of things are happening on the earth. Weather conditions are, you know, God never designed all that, but it is happening because all of creation is under the bondage to corruption. So why are babies born with birth defects? God never intended that, right? Uh, there are genetic disorders. Uh, new things seem to happen. Uh, sometimes, you know, things that we can't even understand happen. Why is it? Well, remember, creation is under the bondage to corruption. Things have deviated and continue to deviate from their original state, original design, of, of perfect design. So it's a downward trend. It's going down and down. And we just we see more and more and more deviations from God's original design. And that's stated right here in Romans 8.21. Creation right now is in the bondage of corruption, but a time will come when creation will be delivered from this bondage to corruption and will be brought into the glorious liberty of the children of God. And that's when there's going to be new heavens, new earth, and none of these things will be there in that new heavens and the new earth. And so he says, going back now to Romans 8.22, he says, we know the whole creation is groaning and laboring with birth pangs until now. So right now it's going through this pain. You know, it's like a woman... Um, uh, who's about to give birth. Uh, there's so much of pain. Uh, you know, something good is going to happen. A child is going to be born. But at the moment, there is pain. So creation is right now in that kind of a state. Uh, it's groaning. It's, it's, it's having pain. But something good is going to come, right? And verse 23, even we, we who have the first fruits of the Spirit, that means we have tasted of, you know, God has given us this first fruit. He's given us the Holy Spirit. We are children of God. We are sons and daughters of God. We have the first fruits, but we also are groaning. It means we also are going through this. Our bodies decay, you know, emotions. We have all kinds of challenges, but we groan. And, but we are waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. That means, you know, part of our redemption we're experiencing right now, uh, we're enjoying the benefits of our redemption, but this will be climax. We will receive the full benefits of our redemption when we have the redemption of our body. That means this body will, mortal will put on immortality. We will have glorified bodies. But until that happens, right now, the sufferings, of this present time. We're going through it. Creation is in a state of deviation from its original design, is in the bondage of corruption, and we ourselves experience these things, right? So the point is, when we see things happen on the earth, keep this in mind. It's not God's fault. God didn't design you know, the hurricanes. He didn't design the earthquakes, the tsunamis, the volcanoes. Uh, the birth defects. It's not God. But God let it go because 
of what he was going to have in the future. Right? He knew what was going to happen. But today, when we see these things, we need to understand it from this perspective that creation is under the bondage of corruption. So what must we do? How do we respond to this? Well, follow Jesus. Example. When Jesus saw a blind man, right? John chapter 9, the disciples asked, Lord, who sinned? Did this man sin? Did his parents sin? And so they're immediately thinking, okay, sin is the cause for his blindness. Well, yeah, yes, in one way, sin is the cause for every thing that we have on the earth, all the evil that we have on the earth. That is true. But what did Jesus do in that situation? John chapter 9, what did he say? He said, neither this man sinned nor his parents, but we must work the works of God. That means as we come into the situation where somebody is experiencing the effect of the bondage of corruption, in this case, he was born blind. God didn't make him that way. He's experiencing the bondage of corruption. Something has gone wrong. You and I are coming on the scene. What must we do? Jesus said, let's work the works of God. What are the works of God? To bring things into its original state. So in that case, let's get his blind eyes to see. Right. So that's how we must approach life situations. So when Jesus was in the boat, he faced a storm. All right. It's a weather condition, a storm. How, why is a storm happening? Did God design a world with storms? No. Is this storm caused by the father trying to drown his son and his disciples? No. The storm is happening. Why is it happening? Well, it could be one of two reasons. One is there is this bondage of corruption, whether, whether conditions have been affected and cause storms, or sometimes we could say demonic powers use natural elements and weather conditions to cause harm. But what did Jesus do? He stands up and says, peace be still. He's exercising authority and dominion over that natural weather condition. Peace be still. So that's how we handle things when we see the effects of the bondage of corruption, whether it's in the physical bodies and minds and people or in circumstances, we say we're here to enforce the work of God. What is the work of God? Work, the work of God is an expression of the heart of God. God's works are always aligned to his heart. Right? So we know his heart, the heart of God, his original intent. So the works of God are aligned to that. And that's what we must do. Right, when we follow the example of Jesus. Let me pause and take some questions. Any thoughts, any questions on this? Uh, everyone following what, what I was saying? Is it clear? All right. Any questions? Andrew, we have a question or? Uh, sir, uh, my one personal question is like, uh, uh, God created Adam in his own image. Like mm. was Adam created in the spirit or pastor was he, was he in the flesh? That's my question. Mm. Because even uh, uh, Satan was in spirit, right, pastor? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So, Adam, so remember, as human beings, we are tripart beings, spirit, soul, body. So Adam was created, like all of us, as a tripart being, spirit, soul, body. So 
he was formed from the dust of the earth his body was formed from the dust of the earth that's the physical and the Bible says God breathed into this form made from the dust of the earth and Adam became a living being so when God breathed he imparted something of himself into Adam that's when Adam's spirit was created and his mind his soul part came alive in this physical body so in that instant a piece of clay became a human being right that's the miracle of God the creative work of God but Adam was a spirit soul and body so in his spirit he could relate to God in his soul he could relate in the soul and body he could relate to this natural world of course spirit and soul relate to God soul and body relate to this natural world so he was created spirit soul and body now when when the Bible says in Genesis 1 and other places as well when we are created in the image of God it's talking about form uh, image and likeness right so it uses two words uh, Genesis 1 we are created in the image of God and in the likeness of God the image refers to the outward form the likeness represents the inner nature so you are both the image meaning outward form so God has a form so God is a spirit John 4 24 but when we say God is a spirit, it doesn't mean he's like, you know, air that has no form or a cloud. God is not formless. God has a form. And so when man was created in the image of God, he was created in the outward form of God. So that's why we have eyes because God has eyes. We have ears because God has ears. We have hands because God has hands. And so our form is like unto him. That's why even in the Bible, we see, you know, the same images used of God, the hand of the Lord, the eyes of the Lord, the ears of the Lord, the mouth of the Lord, the feet of the Lord, you know. Uh, uh, and, and, and so it's not that, God is taking on human form. No, humans were created in his form, in his image. So image, meaning outward form. Likeness, meaning inner nature. So the nature of God was actually reproduced in man. The capacity to love, you know, all the virtues of God. Love, kindness, meekness. The very nature of God was reproduced in man. So when the Bible says, Genesis 1, Man was made in the image and the likeness of God. When I say man, the Bible very clearly says man and woman, right? So both male and female were created in the image and likeness of God, in the outward form and the inner nature of God. That's why in Luke 3 and verse 38, it calls Adam the son of God. Because son meaning he's derived his nature from his father, right? So Adam received his outward form and inner nature from God. God was his father. So that's what it means. Right? What about angels and demonic uh, de demons, Pastor? Hmm. Whether the same created or different? Correct. So the interesting thing is, at some point, before he created man, God created angels. Now, it does not tell us about about angels and you can read this in Hebrews chapter 1 he did not create them in his own image they were created beings but they were not created in his image and in his likeness it doesn't say tell us that so that way humans are different from angels or angels are different from humans angels are created beings but they're different it's only of humans 
and Hebrews chapter 1 brings this out, that humans are created in the image and likeness of God. So angels are created beings. So God didn't create demons. So what happened? We know uh, that Lucifer, who was, you know, so when God created angels, there was a hierarchy. We know of three archangels, Lucifer, Gabriel, and Michael. Three archangels are mentioned in the Bible. And one of them, Lucifer, the, uh, you know, Isaiah 14, Ezekiel 28, talk about this, where uh, he chose, he deceived himself. Yeah. So that was a problem. What was his deception? His self deception was I can become like the Most High. Right? So Isaiah 14, you know, about I don't know, four or five times he says, I will, I will ascend to the Most High. I will become like the Most High. I will, I will, I will. You know, so that is self deception. He deceived himself into thinking he could become like God. So, you know, so people ask the question, if Lucifer was an angel created by God, and he was in heaven where there was no sin, true, there was no sin. He was in the very glory presence of God. How could he have sinned? Where did the sin come from? He was in the very presence. He was right there in, the, in front of God. He was a worshipping angel in Isaiah 14 describes that he was uh, he was the archangel in charge of the worship of heaven can you imagine that that means he must have been right there leading worship in heaven like you know the main angel in charge of all the worshiping angels and all the angels there he was the archangel in the very presence of god in the glory of god and in the presence of there was no sin you know how could he have sinned Self-deception. He deceived himself. So that's how he decided. He thought in his, you know, I will become like God. And that's how, uh, and he convinced a third of the angels to join with him. We see this in Revelation chapter 12. And so these Lucifer and one third of the angels were cast out of heaven and these and they were disembodied that means when god created angels he gave them spiritual bodies bodies that are made of spiritual material and the interesting thing about that physical that spiritual material is it could take on natural form which we see in uh, you know after god created na the natural world angels could appear as man men so there was something about that spiritual material. It can move from spirit realm to natural realm and also take on the form of a man. So Lucifer and these angels, one third of the angels that he deceived, who were created as angels, they had spiritual bodies. They were cast out of heaven and they became what we refer to as disembodied spirits. They are spiritual beings. But in some way, and we don't know exactly you know, how to communicate this because we don't have enough information to give details, but the bodies that angels had was taken away. So they were cast out of heaven. So they are spirit beings, but they are disembodied spirits. To what degree, to what sense, we don't know. Uh, because the reason we say they are disembodied is because they can enter into human beings. They can enter into animals. So that's why we say they seek habitation. They can, uh, they seek embodiment, right? So Satan, uh, so Satan and his demons are disembodied spirits. There are angels who are in their original state, who are serving God, who are faithful to God. These are fallen angels. We call them fallen angels because they have lost their original state. 
as the angels of God and they are disembodied and that is how they came about right so they are spirit beings but they can they seek expression in the natural world and they can use things in the natural world to express themselves yeah that's just a little gist I'm not you know we're not covering everything but to answer your question I hope that explains thank you so much Okay, uh, any other question on this bondage to corruption? Okay, so keep this in mind, you know, that, uh, okay, Sam or Gertrude, you have a question? Pastor. Go ahead. Um, Jesus rebuked weather conditions, but uh, in our times, uh, has any believer rebuked the weather condition that you know of? Well, um, I know of situations where uh, we have prayed, or uh, and, and then again, I forget all the details, but whether we, pray, whether we rebuked or we have prayed for situations, uh, for the weather conditions, e example in situations for uh, the rain to stop or in situations for the rain to come and also have heard of other stories uh, where people have prayed and they have seen God do these things, right? Uh, and it, it usually, usually it has to either have rain or stop the rain, you know, uh, sometimes where there's a place of drought or rain hasn't happened, we pray and rain comes or things like that. But it's not something, so it, so to answer your question, yes, it has happened in these, in, in these ways. Um, what but, about the hurricane and cyclones and all in the magnitude of the weather conditions? I mean, yes. uh, at that level. Yeah. Um, so in the case of storms and hurricanes and tornadoes, um, I, yeah, since you know we don't see things directly here, uh, I, I don't know, you know, like firsthand of stories, but I'm sure there, there, there would be, I personally don't know the stories, I can't think of that right now, but I personally, I, I believe there would be these stories where people have experienced God's intervention in these matters, just that we don't see it, uh, you know, like a, uh, as often, especially in parts of the world where these kinds of weather conditions happen. You know, we are not seeing much of believers taking authority over those conditions. Um, but yeah. Uh, but if we pray, we could do it, no, Pastor? If the yes. whole community prays, maybe we could do it. It's yes, possible. yes. Yeah, I believe that because, you know, ultimately it's God who's going to act. And God definitely has the power to either, you know, divert it, move this away, or uh, quench it and make it nothing. So God definitely has that. And uh, uh, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm sure that as believers get together and pray in these areas, these kinds of things can happen, these miracles can happen. Uh, God can intervene in those situations, yeah. Thank you, Pastor. Welcome. Sam, you have a question? Yeah, uh, Pastor, so we're talking about uh, suffering. And um, uh, like I, I have relatives who are, you know, in the medical field, like especially missionaries, they're very strong believers. But what I've kind of noticed is um, they they think that, or or this is the stance they take that this is part of life. You know, they they are seeing this every day: sickness, terminal diseases, and so you know when it comes to healing, uh, you know over time I feel uh, they are they have kind of settled. And I, and so how do we approach that? Like, you know, that we need to kind of state scripture, obviously, that God always heals and we have to believe for the best until the end. 
that's our posture but that's that's something that uh, that's a conversation that's sometimes hard you know because they they're like hey i'm i'm seeing it every day um uh, you know so that's sometimes a little um we want to pray for healing we want them also to kind of believe for healing even though they are seeing this every day so how do we kind of approach those conversations mm mm-hmm. um yeah, i mean what you're saying is very true you know that christians i mean believers right when they especially in the medical field uh, when they see the suffering death pain you know and whatever departments they're working on and uh, they almost like uh, this overwhelms them right so it overwhelms whatever they've been taught or whatever faith they've had it overwhelms them and say okay this is i'm seeing this every day throughout the day so it is true and uh, i think uh, we just have to you know very lovingly point to the fact that hey let us begin with who god is let's look to god first uh, let's not look at the circumstances we're not denying the circumstance and uh, you know we have to empathize with them that they are seeing this more than us you know we are not in those scenarios day to day seeing death and suffering and pain and sickness uh, you know throughout the day but they are seeing it all the time so we empathize with that so we understand you know what you're going through but can we start with who god is and then from there look at it look at uh look at the situation and he said like uh, obviously we're not saying you know uh, give up your medical practice or we're not saying prayer is a magic wand that we can wave on every person no 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 but to whatever extent you can to pray and to still minister out of the nature of god because even as a doctor your goal is to heal or your goal is to see people healed or to see people well or and so you see that see it from who god is and i think if we can you know have that conversation and open their heart to that perspective if they're willing to step into it yeah and slowly it can change you know but the reality is for many of them it's very difficult because they're seeing it throughout the day work day you know yeah but so just one more angle on that is uh, this is the tougher one where so some settle like okay they don't pray for healing but some think that yeah this is maybe god's plan for this person's life mm. and you know because cuz you know people in say you know terminal illness or crutches mm. or whatever mm. yeah this is maybe god's will and through this god will be glorified Uh, first of all are those statements um biblical to attribute sickness or of ailment um you know to, to attribute it to god's will or god's plan for that per- person's life and again how do we kind of approach so that's just another angle mm. Mm. because i remember even like you know a person coming to our, our services and we talk about healing and in the back of their head they're thinking of someone <laughs> with that ailment yeah 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 so this that's also a challenge right first uh, first of all uh, those statements are not true right it may be something that uh, different theological positions have like right? you know some people say oh sickness is the god you know that that sickness god gave it to that person or god put it on that person to teach them some lesson but those are not true because you know just the fact that who is god he said i am jehovah rafa he is the lord our healer if he is the physician then he's not if he's a physician is the one who removes sickness not the one who gives sickness i mean nobody goes to a doctor and the doctor says come 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 i'll give you some sickness to teach you make you more mature you know no 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 doctor does that and nobody goes to a doctor to do get that sickness and if god is a great physician some for somebody to say you know god put that sickness to teach you a lesson that they're contradicting the very nature of god so we know that all those statements are not biblical uh, they're not scriptural but they have been passed on in a lot of christian circles and a lot of 
theological circles that comes you know that is their perspective so the way we challenge them is or the way we should talk about it is look there is truth and there is experience don't base your theology on experience just somebody's experience base it on the truth the truth is who God is he is truth Jesus said I am the way the truth the truth is who Jesus is um, uh, everything Jesus is everything he said and did that is truth do we see Jesus ever making a person sick no do we see ever Jesus ever telling a sick person this is God's will for you no right so that is truth what we have to do is we have to raise the level of our experience to the level of truth and that's the journey we are making so if people ask you know why don't everybody be pray for get healed then we are in that process and right? we want to press our press to that yeah so that's kind of how we can you know work with them I know I haven't given a full answer but I just see the time so uh, we need to pause here yeah thank you much yeah okay thank you everyone we'll pause here uh, we'll continue this next week and uh, we'll take more questions Thank you, everyone. We'll get ready for our next class. Thank you.